two months into that, you, st you did then start to think, I need to get out more. Before lockdown started, I was lucky to have finished a tour that I'd organised, a UK tour, with my 12-piece band, Pavillon. So that was my last substantial bit of work before lockdown. And uh, I did add a few, few other little things, a few sessions, things like that. But that was the main thing. The last bit of work I was doing uh, was a rehearsal at the Royal Opera House. Um, in the morning, we were meant to be doing a show in the evening and we were all cancelled and told to go home. That was on March the 16th. Um, the day before that, I'd managed to squeeze in a very um, fortuitous session for me because I've been recording um, over the last couple of years a project at the Guildhall of my pieces that I've written some of my compositions using the students' um, former presence and, and the professors as well. On the Monday when we were sent home, there was this um, strange feeling of excitement amongst us. Um, maybe I shouldn't say it, but we were uh, partly because of them, they'd cancelled the, uh, the final performance of Fidelio. So as, as horn players, of course, we were, um, it's quite a significant uh, little piece to play. And um, <laughs> the thought of not having to play that again um, was quite satisfying for some reason. <laughs> oh, before lockdown, I had a full diary and I was on, on tour uh, with, a, with, a, with an orchestra and a choir in, in Germany. The last thing I did before lockdown was a performance of the Glier Horn Concerto in Hartford. And um, yeah, actually I was meant to have a really busy week, but that was the time when concerts were getting cancelled by the hour, so it was really unsure. But yeah, it was the 14th of March. The last project I did before lockdown um, was with the Aurora Orchestra, and we played uh, Beethoven's First Symphony in Switzerland. And then I did a patch of film sessions um, and I was all set to go and do a big patch of work in Italy um, before coronavirus hit. The last thing I did before lockdown was a recording actually in Potton Hall in Suffolk, a beautiful barn that's uh, converted into a recording studio. I was recording some songs, a wonderful song cycle by Richard Corston. It's a place where the mobile signal isn't very good anyway, so we, we were just uh, unaware really, blissfully unaware of what was going on and then we get back to the a tell every night and put on the news. And it became very obvious that that would be the last bit of work for any of us for, for some time, as indeed it was. And the last bit of work I did before lockdown was with SCO, with Scottish Chamber Orchestra. So I was borrowing their natural horn and I had like two weeks on the natural horn. And in between the two weeks, like over the weekend, that's when everything got cancelled. So I was there at my mum's house in Scotland with this natural horn and then there was no Basically everything got cancelled. So then um, I had the natural horn in my mum's attic for like four months and I could have been practicing the whole time, but I wasn't. Then lockdown happened uh, and it was quite dramatic because there was, I had work in and it was just all gone, just gone, completely gone. And some of it, especially the jazz, the jazz gigs I had with other people, not my own gigs. They just disappeared. They, nobody tells you. You just, <laughs> you just assume it's not on. It's all just gone. Everything was gone. It was very depressing. Very depressing time. But I saw it. I thought, right. I saw it as an opportunity to do loads of work, loads of practice. I did hours and hours and hours of practice. Since the start of lockdown, um, I quite enjoyed the first month because I took some time off. I think most musicians used it as a chance to just have a break, not play, um, you know, rest and recuperate from the general sort of busy lifestyle that we lead. Um, and it was great. And then after that, I, I mean, we were decorating the house, doing as much as we could. Built a wardrobe that took eight hours. That was an interesting day. Um, and yeah, we've just been spending time together, me and my other half. The transition wasn't actually that difficult because you see, I'm retired from full-time employment. My last full-time job was running the wonderful Bromley Youth Music Trust. I was principal there, plus doing recording work on the side. Um, and I retired from that quite a few years ago. During lockdown, I've been practicing um, my instrument in the morning, every day. Uh, I've been gardening rigorously. 
um, and I've been working for a removals company, hauling sofas and washing machines up and down stairs. Since the start of lockdown, I've been just uh, finding uh, a reason to practice. I've been uh, doing lots of teaching at the Guildhall to finish off what I have to do there. Um, I've had the odd, very odd session come in, but that was after about three months of doing nothing. I found the first uh, three weeks of it quite exciting because the, uh, the Opera House works very hard and uh, it felt to me, I think, mentally like I was on holiday. Um, so I, I really switched off and thought it was great. <laughs> So I've been at my mum's in Scotland since the middle of March and she lives by the sea and it's like beautiful and it was really nice to get out of London because I mean I hear London, imagine if you're in a really crowded flat that must be awful but so I was really lucky to get open space and scenery and stuff but I was very isolated, I mean we all were but I felt like out of my place, you know, in the world. When the lockdown was imposed I kind of knew that it was going to be for a while and I'd had like an extremely busy patch so I decided to stop playing the horn um, with no kind of determined set time when I would return. I said I would be completely guided by my feeling. It happened I took two weeks off and then basically since then, so more or less the beginning of April, I've practiced as normal. And then I discovered that I was eating and drinking far too much, as one does. So I knocked that on the head and was a bit more sensible. So knowing you've got nothing in the book, Nothing that you have to have straight chops for, you know, a Mozart 29 or something. You know you haven't. So you don't have to worry about it. You can wreck your chops completely. It's really great. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> yeah. It feels a long time since we've done any live music. So it's a joy to get together with Ben and Hugh and put together a performance of, of this amazing piece of, of Britain. So the first day of work I did was at the beginning of June in the studio and it was a really small session, there was only like eight of us and they had the flute player in a booth with like plastic screens, not only left and right and behind but also on top. So um, he was protected from blowing his air at us, it was bizarre. This was the one thing I could really focus on and, and practice, have the luxury of th three months I suppose with nothing much else to do and then as soon as you know as soon as things were open again and there, there was a place we could stay we, we went there the first weekend and, and finished the disc so that kind of book ended the most severe strict part of the lockdown for, for me. Decided that I needed to start playing again and I was actually missing it so I, I started by just doing half an hour a day which was probably the worst thing that I could have done because <laughs> As musicians, we're, we set ourselves a standard and I was used to kind of being able to perform at a certain standard and from half an hour a day, I was sort of coast along about 50%, which was just really irritating. And then actually I ended up doing a little bit of work um, just after lockdown finished. I was one of the lucky ones and just went and did four days. The LSO did a, an online concert. So I went and did that one, which was good to have something to prepare for again. Um, and really enjoyed that. When I was in the LSO many years ago, um, I was in the, in the early 80s, um, I was in the section with um, David Cripps, Tony Chadell, Jim Brown, and uh, Terry Johns, better known as Drac. Um, Drac and I used to mess around quite a lot, um, playing um, silly tunes, making up silly tunes, and uh, he's a very fine um, musician and writer himself, and um, we used to egg each other on. And, uh, um, we used to play silly tunes in the style of um, Laurel and Hardy, if you've ever seen any of those soundtracks. Um, and one of them was the, 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 the sort of Rite of Spring, just the, just the first little you know, bassoon tune. Um, and then I, I thought it would be quite fun to turn it into a proper piece, if you want to call it that. And so that was a, I wrote that and um, it's sort of just become quite a popular piece, really. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice to have a chance to get it recorded. <laughs> 